to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Westlaw Councillor Abby Keyes. Westlaw came to be when originally surveyed in 1912. The land for the town site was purchased by William Westgate and William Lockhart. This gave way to the name Westlock. The village of Westlock was incorporated on March 13, 1916, and just over 30 years later, Westlock became a town. By the end of World War I, Westlock was an established service center for the agricultural community, with the first bank north of Edmonton, a blacksmith, and a general store. Westlock continues to be a thriving economic center and offers exceptional opportunities for businesses and pleasure. You will want to work here, live here and play here. You'll always be ahead in Westlock. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Westlock Councillor Abby Keys. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking an overarching question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Abby? My sense of duty? Um, I've always felt that whatever you put into something, you can take away. And so it's the whole thing of like, when you say, you know, if you didn't vote, then you can't complain about something. And if you don't work or do something to better your community, then you can't complain about your community, right? And so, like, I grew up in a family of six kids um, in Lethbridge, Alberta. I'm a Southern Albertan girl. And we've always just had that instilled in us, too, to serve your community in any way you can, right? Right. And usually when you're serving someone else, it makes you feel good. So it's you a win-win situation. Um, and then like I got married and had children and moved around. My, my one son's like, hey, you're talking about me. Um, moved around a little bit. And so then you have to like make your own community in places when you don't know anyone. And so um using different organizations and supports, like, uh, what was it? Before FCSS, it was called Parent Link, right? Do you remember Parent Link back in the I day? Certainly, I, I, I certainly do remember Parent Link, and I think it got canceled in 24, 26, 15 or 16, one of like right, right around that era. Yes, I was working for a municipality yeah. in North of Alberta when that got canceled, and I remember the uproar it happened. <laughs> Right. And like I was in St. Paul at the time because we were there for a year, our family, because um, my now ex-husband was doing like a practicum like for his law degree. So we were there for a year. I didn't know anybody. Went to Parent Link with my little babies and we formed a community. And from that, Parent Link in St. Paul was meeting in a basement and there was like 50 families. There was tons of people there. And I started a little petition of um, saying that we needed more space and the the hallway going down was very narrow and there was stairs, so it wasn't safe too. And so um, got a lot of people to sign it and got to listen to lots of different stories, went to the municipal council there and they made changes, right? They heard the people, they made changes. So I think that was like my first real taste of like municipal politics, so to speak. And then moving to Westlock, um, you know, kind of jumped in after I moved here. They did an election in like 2016, 
2017. I'm trying to remember when the election was. 2017 and was the election. 2017. Okay. So we moved here in 2016. 2017 was the election. I tried to talk to some friends to kind of get maybe a female involved on council because a lot of the time in rural communities, it's a lot of men, a lot of like businessmen, sometimes older retired men. And I was like, let's get, let's get a lady in there. Right. Especially like a younger lady that might speak more for families and uh nobody wanted to do it i was too new to the community to like jump in and then waited till 2021 and that's when i threw my hat in so i that's i traditionally no i traditionally don't do a lot of research on my guests because i like to learn about them from them during the interview because my listeners and viewers probably don't know who you are so i shouldn't just do a lot of extensive research but i did find an article about you when you did announce now you announced your run for municipal elections on international women's day in 2021 you were the very first person in westlock to put their name for it and you ran on that that issue of we need a woman's voice on council because at that time, for, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, there hadn't been that many female representatives in Westlock. I'm going to ask has, a very. There has been female mayors in the past. One yes. of our councils now, Councillor Mori, her mother was mayor, I think in the late 90s, early 90s, for I think three or four terms. So there has been women, but then it kind of hit like a a desert for a bit right so so i want to ask uh, we're, we're, i jump around a lot on this show and we're not it's only okay, we're too. only we're only five minutes in and i feel like we're going to go down a rabbit hole and i love it already Let's why do it. you think it's important for more women to get involved in municipal politics um so nah. my sister-in-law um alana when i was telling her that i was running she told me of this forum that the Lethbridge Library was putting on with women in politics. And they had a panel of different women. One of them is now um, the mayor of Okotoks. I think she was a counselor at the time when she spoke. And the common theme amongst all of the speakers, like there were some council people from I think there's one from like Colehurst, like it was a bunch of different women, mostly from Southern Alberta. And the common theme of why they ran was to increase like the social programming in communities, right? Because that was lacking a lot of the time in municipalities. And a lot of it is just basic budgeting, right? Like where are the dollars going? Let's, let's put them towards infrastructure for roads, you know, which is important. We need that. But also don't forget about doing some things that benefit families, right? Um, that create a community hub, that create these networks that, especially in smaller towns, we need so badly, right? So yeah. you you put your name forward and you you get elected. And I, I'm kind of kind of going to ask a stupid question, but I've got to ask it before I ask the next question. And that is, prior to putting your name on the ballot in 2021, prior to presenting in front of council in St. Paul's about Parent Link, had you considered a life in politics or was politics so far away from what Abby wanted to do in her 30s and 40s that it was never something on your radar and it came later in life? Or were you like me, sort of a political bug when you were 10 and wanted, while people had posters of movies on their walls, I had posters of prime ministers and mayors and premiers on my wall. So did the political bug come to you early or was it a later life, later in life? So who did you have on your wall, Chris? I need to know now. Okay, so I had Kim Campbell, I had Mike Harris, I had Bob Ray, I had John Cretchen, I had Brian Mulroody. Yes, I was that person. <laughs> right, just like a mural of just yep. heads. Yep. Okay. Yep. I, love I, it. I think at one point in time, even I had one. I had. I think it was either Peter Lougheed or Don Getty, who I had on my wall as well, because I was from Ontario and I was looking through those formative years of trying to figure out who I wanted to be as a politician when I grew up. So I took inspirations from every political party. And then at the end of the day, I found out municipal, municipal is where it's at. 
It is. It is where it's at, right? Because you can be you. You don't have to be under any kind of party, at least right now. But we don't need <laughs> to get into that right now. That's cool. Don't get me started. Um, I was one of those weird kids, but I also want to do everything, right? Like I remember in grade six, we had to write like what we wanted to do. And I was like, I want to do this and this. And, th and one of them was like, I want to be a mayor, right? So not that I, now that I know what a mayor does, I'm happy being a counselor and I don't really aspire to be more than a counselor at this point. Um, but I was one of those kids that loved politics, but also loved kind of the comedy behind politics too, if that makes sense. Like, I watch Saturday Night Live every Saturday. I watch This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Like, I like to know about the issues, but I also liked to have fun with the issues too, right? So, so yeah, I've, you... always, I've always wanted that. And, like, I like Parks and Rec. Like, everyone wants to be a Leslie Nope, right? Come on. Who doesn't want to be the low... Nope for 2012. Let's come on. Let's do it. Um, So you get elected in 2021, and... I, I don't want to put words in your mouth at all, but I can imagine it is a tough time to be elected post COVID-19 and there, like the, the role of the municipality changed a lot during those COVID-19 years into what it was and where you are now. Was it what you expected prior to getting elected to where you are now? Um, I think so. Like, when I put my name forward to, I started before that and after that, I started tuning into the council meetings as well to kind of know what goes on. Um, and during COVID, you got to see all the different counselors come up on the screen too. And you could see like, oh, the mayor has, he must like the color orange because the background of his walls painted orange, right? Like you kind of got a little glimpse into their lives too a bit. Um but I think anyone as a first time counselor, it is a lot. It's more than what you expected, but it's also more amazing that what, than what you expected. It's harder, but also more amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of speaks to like the collaborative effort of any board that you're on, of council, of working with your CAO, um, even though some things can kind of get hard, the end result is always better than what you could have imagined too, right? What do you wish you would have known then that you know now to make your first year? Because we have listeners from across Canada who listen to the show, who are municipal leaders who just got elected, who are 20 years into their uh, tenure as a municipal leader. What's the one thing you wish you would have known that you would want to instill upon someone else who is just about to take that step to say, okay, I want to be the next Abby. I want to be the next counselor. I want to be the next mayor, but I'm not sure what it entitles. What advice that would you have given your younger self prior to entering into politics to make it an easier transition or easier tenure that you've already had so far? Um. I think one thing that sticks out too is like, don't, don't go in on one issue. Like if you're like, I want to be a counselor, this is what I want to see happen. This one thing. And I want to see it happen within a year. Like honey is going to take way more than what you think. Right. And, and usually if you ha come in with one issue, there's usually a reason why that hasn't been dealt with maybe for, a, and, and, so have an open mind and go in, you know, killing people with kindness instead of going in with like one, um, going in angry with, with something, if that makes sense. It, it, it does. I want to turn for a second to the role of the counselor. Now, we are about three years into your term. We are coming up to your fourth year yeah well you're going into your fourth year term fourth year in November, October of later this year you've probably come to the realization you've had to make some very tough choices and we can talk about the issue that happened earlier this year in Westlock but let's leave that for a later conversation so you've had to make some very tough choices in Westlock and that's just around budget around what is cut what isn't cut how to fund things whose road gets paved and what roads don't get paved 
And I, I I can imagine you've come to the realization that you're you know you've not you're not pleasing 100 percent of the people in your community on 100 percent of the issues. How do you make those tough decisions? How do you, as the one counselor with one vote, make those tough decisions to make sure that you're doing it in the best interest of the entire community and not making a negative impact on your community? I think as council, right, we have one employee and that's our CAO, right? And if you have a good CAO who makes a good team for your admin mm -hmm. and they're able to gather accurate data and they're always looking for the data, then your decisions become a million times easier to make because you don't have to just pull out of the abyss. You can say, this is the data we have. This is the road that needs to get done because of this uh, engineering report, right? Like if you have all of the data, then it speaks for itself, right? Do you balance that with the resident's input though? Because administration, as someone who kind of comes from administration, I know firsthand that you can give those recommendations and uh, council will have to go out and uh, see what if there's an interest in that. So did, do you balance that with the resident input in Westlock Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So I've often said on this show, and I say this all the time, and people often get angry at me because I, I only speak to municipal leaders, but I find that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics, unless there's something controversial or unless the snow isn't plowed to the, the extent that they expect or the water, the grass isn't uh, trimmed as uh, neatly as they want, or the water isn't turned on when they go to flush their toilet. People tr traditionally have an apathy of what's going on at City Hall. Would you agree with that? That people, and if you don't, please tell me why. But would you would you say that there's an apathy on what goes on at actually goes on at City Hall, or no? Yes. Absolutely. Really. And that's why. That's why it's good when you're sharing things. You share it not just once. You share it three <laughs> times. You share it four times. Right. Like. You have to, uh, someone might see something on social media and be like, oh, that's interesting, right? But if you're like, and you also have to spell it out too a bit, right? To be like, this affects you because, right? Like you need to come to this if you want to help in the next planning for the next 20 years, right? Like, but there is, there is apathy almost until it becomes a crisis and then people come in and fill up right but otherwise if things are like you said if things are running and it's things are status quo people don't really they don't care as much are, the, are people willing to give you their feedback yes like on what's going on at city hall let's let's take out let's take an example H hypothetically there's water flushing or there's something going on with a snow plow is only doing this part of the area this part of the town uh more often than this part of the town are people willing to say hey counselor what's going on here or is there a traditional apathy of uh they'll get to us when we get to us or are they willing to actually talk to you about the challenges they'll, that you're they'll talk to <laughs> yeah, they'll talk to counselors and like, because I'm relatively new, I feel like the people that approach me are typically people in my age group, right? Like young moms will be like, this is what I saw. They'll approach me. There's other counselors that have been around for decades. And so they have relationships with people in town and those people know how to reach, reach those counselors, right? So there is feedback um, all the time, especially with things like snow removal <laughs> but we've also created a good system now where it rotates before um years before it was always a then b then c then d and now it's always a but b and c and d rotate yeah with every removal and so i think that's helped in that sense before we turn to Westlock as a whole and the challenges and the accomplishments of your community i want to ask us a lighthearted question. Um, 
the role of the municipal counselor, many people might think it's a part-time job and you only have to go to meetings and that's all you do. And that's all you will ever do is just go sit in a meeting once a week and just make decisions, but that's it. But you know, the moment you leave your house, you are counselor. The moment you go to the grocery store to go get gas, to go to the bank, you are counselor in every position. How hard is it for you to go in to grab a carton of milk these days and just come home without people stopping you? And do the kids really want to come with mom when they have to go deal with the mom, counselor mom all the time? Uh, it happens. <laughs> but also the kids will use it as a card too, where they're like, my mom should count, right? Like they'll, they'll use that a little bit. But like, especially the library, I'm on the library board. Before that, I was on Friends of the Library. Like, I love my library. I love my library lady so much. And, but anytime I go in, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to grab a hold. Like, and the kids are like, no, because they know as soon as I go in, like, it's going to be at least 15 minutes, right? So that annoys them a little bit. We we have gotten um, a self-checkout now. Uh, which is great for if you want to get something quick or if you're getting something a little spicy that you don't want the ladies to see, right? Like you kind of have that. But uh, I think part of going to the library is having those interactions as well, right? So, do you thrive on that? Thrive on interactions? Do you No, do you thrive on the interactions with people? Because the, a lot of people that I've spoken to in, in, on this show, there, there are a lot of introvert extroverts, the municipal leaders who are who push themselves to be extroverts, but internally they just want to be at home and just sit there and just not have to deal with the general public. But you get something out of that, right? You get something out of the ability to go talk to someone about the challenges that they're facing because that makes you a better counselor because you bring their opinions forward. Do you thrive on the ability to just be able to have people come up to you and say, hey, counselor, can we chat for five minutes about what's going on in the library? Yeah, I do. I also like to have the time like at my house to like decompress and be like, okay, I'm going to put my sweatpants on and just read a book for an hour. But if I don't have that balance, like I also need to get out and be part of something and, and talk with people. Like I'm a teacher as well. Right. So, you know, we sure. like, we like our people. Um, I want to turn to the town of Westlock as a whole now. And before I ask the first question, I always preface it because I want to make sure people who are listening understand that this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. If you're about to send your emails, please send them to me and I will file them in the appropriate location as I always do. So with that being said, uh, counselor, <laughs> I, I didn't say that. I just say I. <laughs> File it at the appropriate location. <laughs> Counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing Westlock today? Um, well, no, no surprise. We did have that plebiscite about the rainbow crosswalk, and that really painted how divided we are on that specific issue right and so going forward is like you can't ignore it but trying to because people were hurt I think on both sides of that as well um maybe more so on one side but I think going forward we need to come together and come together with kindness and do what's best for the community to to grow um Westlock has been pretty stagnant. Like it's been at that 5,000 um, per population benchmark. And it's no surprise that municipalities are underfunded by the province. Um, we can't what? keep up. <laughs> Stop the presses. Come on here. What? Sorry to, sorry to break the news on that one. Um, but you can only collect from a tax base so much. And so you you need to have more industry to bring more people and, you know, be able to tax the industry accordingly. So then you don't tax Joe Blow another 7% or whatever that some municipalities have to, right? What was it? Uh, Oh, the the municipality in BC that had like it was it Invermere or oh, something soy, that was like 20%. Soyuz, or, oh, yeah. the the, we the don't town of a, 
No, and and they got they went through heck in a handbag, if you ask me. So for those who don't know, Asoyuz just recently we've talked about it a few times on the show, but I just want to give a little bit of background. Asoyuz raised their taxes, were property taxes, thirty nine percent. That is yeah. water. That is property taxes because for years there was stagnation of zero percent, and they had this big water bill coming up, so they had to raise it. Residents were upset. They sort of. Uh, how do I say this nicely? Voice their concerns <laughs> in a way that should not have been, but they voice their concerns, which is their right if they do it respectfully. And council had to sort of reconsider what was going forward. I haven't gotten a follow up on that, but yeah, I it's challenging for municipalities right now. Right, and so yeah, to grow to grow together in not just like politically, but to grow together in a uh, sustainable way that everyone can like find the community a great home right like that it's it's livable and that it's a place for everyone so uh, i'm gonna play a little bit of uh, chicken and the egg here for a second because uh, before i ask the chicken and the egg question i'm gonna ask the how do you balance people not wanting change in their community with the realities that change needs to happen to grow. Because I can imagine if I go talk to a hundred people, there's going to be people who say, I love Westlock the way it is. It is small. It is the reason why I moved to Westlock. And then there's going to be people who say, I wish there was more housing in the Westlock because I need a place to live and I need my children to be able to stay here. So that way they don't go off to Edmonton or Barhead or down all the way to even St. Albert to go find a house. They want to stay here, but they can't because there's no houses. So how do you balance growth with the people? And I don't want to say people because it's saying it's sort of painting a broad stroke here, but with the idea that Westlock is great the way it is already. Um, I think people that say that they like Westlock and the way it is, like, I think the common denominator for both of it is they like their community, they like their people, right? And so why not have a few more people that, that you can get to know, right? So, <laughs> um, do you get the in nimbyism any... in? Do you, do you get the nimbyism alive and well in Westlock, or is it actually pretty tame up there? What do you mean? Sorry. Like the not in my backyard. I don't want more growth. I don't want to see change. I want to. I wanted to keep it the way it is. Or do you get people? Do you get a sense that people want to see Westlock grow to a potential, not five thousand, but seventy five hundred or even ten thousand people? So that way you do not uh, do the growth on the backs of the people who are there right now, but the growth will be spread evenly across more people who are coming ten years down the line. I think that's a generational thing. I feel like the older generation might feel like they want things the same, but they also want like everything in their lives the same, right? Like the same meals, the same shows, like change, change is a scary thing and it can be a scary thing. But I think people, the younger generations have, have even complained that Westlock hasn't been big enough and that um, whether or not it's true for other councils, they wish there was more industry here. Did you send them joy cards yet? My son's just like, hey, I just got to yeah. check in on something. He's no, I, I, I will cut it out for two seconds unless okay. you need to, do you need to address that. <laughs> Okay. Um, I want to turn uh, to that 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 check that chicken and the egg question, because you talk about the the budgetary challenges that people are facing, even other municipalities are facing. Growth does not come cheap, and I I, I think you would be the first to admit that because uh, the recent poll that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities released that the average municipalities. It's about $107,000 per municipality to put one house into their municipality. That's infrastructure that goes into the road. That's roads. That's this, that, and the other. Now, $107,000 may not seem like a lot to Calgary, Edmonton, or larger municipalities, but Westlock, that's a pretty penny. I don't care where you are. Um, the challenges that growth comes with means that you're going to have to pay for it out of pocket today. 
people are struggling, do you find yourself putting off infrastructure challenges or infrastructure growth because of the realities that people are living in now? Because if you build a road or build a new a housing complex, that means that people are going to have to pay a little bit more for that infrastructure upgrades. Do you, do you find yourself needing to balance the growth with the people's realities that they're facing today? Always, always, right? We don't want to go into a huge deficit or anything like that, right? We we don't want to, to blow the bank on things. So we're absolutely mindful on how we're spending things and making sure we're applying for grants. Um, another thing that we've been working on with our uh, county um and village of Clyde, West, uh, the county of Westlock and the village of Clyde is, um, we've been collaborating with them on a regional economic uh, region, right? Like a regional economic um, committee. And that's been something that's been years in the making. Um, it's something that I feel like our relationships with our county friends have, has come a long ways. Um, and now that we understand that like we need to hunt as a pack and if you've been to any of the the regional economic or economic development conferences they they say that a lot right where it can't be this is ours this is yours like if you get some industry come your way even in the little village of Clyde it benefits us too right because people are going to come and build here and stuff so um, and we're competing against all the big guys, right? Like we're competing against Strathcona County where they have numerous people that they employ just for that. And we yeah. have to work together and we have counselors and we have admin that wear multiple hats to, to make this work. But if we get something like, like a protein uh synthesis plant or something like that that's like half a million dollars that would be a game changer for this region right and it would fit so well because we're not that far away from Edmonton no. and there's so much industry like agricultural industry here that can work with something like that so yeah we are we are mindful in our growth we want to grow and just all of us putting some money towards this. We have a website that's launched this last uh, couple of weeks here and it's beautiful. Like it's, there's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears put into it and I'm really proud of it. Um, I want to talk about, I want to flip the original question a little bit here for a second because um, I want to not only talk about challenges because I get accused all the time on this show that I only <laughs> talk about challenges. So I'm going to flip the script. Are you a downer? <laughs> I, I try not to be, but I got accused <laughs> by a count by a counselor here in Alberta. And ever since then, I feel like I need to ask that because I'm like, you're right. I should be talking about the positive things because you know what? Municipalities do have good things going for them right now. So I've got to ask the question then, in your opinion, what is the thing that you boast about when it comes to Westlock? While you have your challenges, which every municipality across this country does, what's the one thing that you look at and you say, you know what, we do have our challenges, but at least we've got this going for us. Um, and I was joking about being a Debbie Downer. You're like a very positive guy, Chris. Like, um, yeah. I try. <laughs> our, our positive things we got going here, um, like I've... It's kind of a cliche, but the people here are amazing. We have some really good people. And the other counselors would joke with me and say, like, I'd be like, you talk to anybody and they always have like a connection to Westlock somehow. And I was like, this was Counselor Wold. And I was like, Counselor Wold, you just say that because you're related to like half the people here, which is also true. I was in the like Vancouver airport and they were like, hey, like somehow. I started talking to this random family and they're like, yeah, that's my uncle. And I was like, ah, did it again. <laughs> anywhere I go, like we'll talk to like a, like a wait staff or at a conference or something. And there's always a connection to Westlock, which kind of blows my mind because before I moved here, I didn't know it existed. <laughs> right. It's one of those places where you kind of have heard it, but like can't necessarily locate it. Right. Because it's, I'm also from Southern Alberta. So hey, 
I, I, I will be the first to admit that some of the conversations I've had on this show, I would not have been able to point to the, a map on a map where some of these municipalities are, but it's through conversations like this that you actually get to learn about these different communities. And I'm so honored that people like yourself and people who I've had on the show who are, are willing to come on and talk about their community because Heck, I, I knew about West Lock because I worked up in Slave Lake and when I drove back and forth to Calgary. Mentioned. Exactly. So it, that plus I also, for those who are listening and who are listening to this from West Lock, I was your liberal candidate in 2015 under Justin Trudeau. Thank you for not voting for me. That was the great, <laughs> great pleasure. So there's my little sh uh, shout out to West Lock. So I was the candidate for Peace River West Lock in 2015. So... There's my little lug. But it's are, true. Where were you living? Where were you living Slave, then? Slave Lake. Okay. So I was the Slave sacrificial. I, it, I like Slave Lake. It, it, it's a beautiful. West Lock's beautiful too. Like every time I go through okay. that, I was just up there in uh, beginning of February when I went up to Grand Prairie for a few days. Um, I was stopped in West Lock because I, uh, I it brought back old memories, right? Because you stop at the old the church right beside the McDonald's, and then you just take your your like. I had people who were playing Pokemon Go along with myself, and there's a lot of Poke stops <laughs> in, in West Lock. So I went around. The stadium, the old... You're at a stadium there or something, hey? Eh? I yeah. went down the Pokemon Go thing for like a month back in the summer of whenever, but. Yes, back to Westlock. Westlock has amazing things, let me tell you. Have you been to Carrie's Cafe? No. Oh, I might have been. Your... Where is it? It's downtown, and it's an old church that's been renovated. It's yes. gorgeous. It has a bakery in the basement. That's a great yeah. thing. A new a new um, place that you'll have to go to is called Bloom. Bloom is run by a family and it's another cafe bakery that's just down the street from Carrie's Cafe. So like we have the problem of two great bakeries. So if you like never have a problem, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. Um, when I first moved here too, because I was kind of I was like BC or bust, like a lot of Albertans when you're first starting out, we're like, we want to I want to move to BC. Why would I live here? Um, there's a place called Long Island Lake. It's a municipal campground and it has a beach. It's in the county of Westlock and it legit is my happy place. I would go there one summer. I made a point of trying to be there, going there 20 times in one summer. I think I made it to 22 times. It is a sandy beach. It is a spring fed lake. You do not get the itch at this lake like you do at some lakes in Alberta and like you can hear the loons you can go on your paddleboard and go out to the little islands and it's just oh it's gorgeous um can I ask one last one question oh? before you continue on what's the one place in the community that you go to to decompress is there a spot, is there a restaurant that you can go and you can just decompress and you know it's your happy place? All the stresses of what you've just dealt with at council can just wash away and you know that tomorrow morning you can get back up and do it all over again? Um, I've been chasing happiness by like stress running to Taylor Swift music on our rotary trail. So there's there's a path that goes behind the spirit center. That's our recreation facility. And it goes like, there's a little, there's tennis courts, there's our graveyard. And then it goes down this like uh, gravel road and then across by the train tracks. And from my house, that loop is about five Ks. And so that's what I do to like decompress is, and that's where I get my best thoughts, right? So like, if I, if I have, an issue by the end of that, it's worked out somehow, right? So I don't know, I don't go and sit, I, I move around and that rotary trail has been amazing. It also loops over to the north side of our community. It's called the Westlock Lagoon. And it's a little kind of hidden lake behind Whistleville, which is another area of our community. And it's a, a paved path and we've been doing some some more things. We'd like to stock that little lagoon so you can fish on it and put a little fountain and skate on it in the winter and stuff. It's a really beautiful place too. 
So you, you, I interrupted you a bit when you were talking about some of the tourist attractions and tourist okay. destinations. But what are the what are the key tourist destinations that any tourist comes to Westlock needs to see? Besides these beautiful bakeries, and uh, I just want to make sure I get the name of it, Bloom. Uh, be, besides those, what are some of the tourist destinations that you recommend to anyone who's coming to Westlock? Okay, so just south of us, this is in Westlock County. There is, um, I don't know how to say it, but there's like a Buddhist place. I don't know if you've been there. Have you been there? Okay, okay. I was there so, the day that they installed the big Buddha. <laughs> it's amazing. It's like you're in a different world and the people that run it are so kind and gracious. Like you can just go there and park in the visitor parking. You could pack a little picnic and just sit and take in the giant Buddha sculptures and like walk the grounds and I believe they do meditation classes there as well that you could go for, but it's like, it blows your mind that there's something this close to Edmonton, let alone Westlock that has so much culture and like, yeah, I, I, I take pictures there and people are like, oh, did you go on vacation? Like, where did you go? And it's like, no, this is in Westlock County and it's amazing and you should see it. Um, but besides that, there's also, we have two museums. We have the Pioneer Museum, which is kind of your standard, like this is what it was like in the past. There's a whole bunch of guns. If you're a gun person, there's farming equipment. There's like an area of like what the hospital used, used to look like. Um, there was a fellow that used to live in Westlock. His name was Dr. Whistle and he's donated some things to the Pioneer Museum. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a little walking tour uh, that went around because his old house is right by the library and it's from like the early 1900s, like it's a hundred year old house. And he was such a like community champion and doing stuff for the airport. And yeah, so there's some of Dr. Whistle's stuff in that Pioneer Museum, as well as we have the Tractor Museum, which has the tallest... Uh, tractor on a weather vane, but it's amazing um and it's a great so, place like you think tractors you think oh it's for like maybe older people that are into farming and the history of it but they have little ride-on tractors that kids can go up and down on and there's um scavenger hunts and there's people that come from all over the world to to check it out so it's it's pretty neat so my final question before I let you go, because I said a half hour and we're almost at the 45 minute mark. So I'm going to ask one last question for you. And that is, in your opinion, what makes Westlock such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Um, It's one of those places that it's not that far from the city, like living in St. Paul. St. Paul was a drive back and forth. You can bop into the city. You're 45 minutes away from St. Albert Costco. So like, you will live not being um, right in the city, but you also have like community. You have neighbors that look out for you. You know your neighbor's names. Like we went on a holiday and our neighbor called the RCMP on our contractor because he did the test of, well, is this person bringing up their garbage? Oh, he's not. So I'm going to wait. Like, so we should have told them that we had some people um, working on our house, but people look out for you. You're close to the city. You have a beautiful pool, beautiful rec center, bakeries, a library. That's fantastic. Like you have everything you need. And if you don't have what you need, you're not that far off from the city. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to sit down and chat to me. It's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders from across Alberta, but also across Canada and talk about their community and why they got involved. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. No worries. Keep doing what you're doing, Chris. I love it. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews or 
our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local governance at work. We're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you've come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.